Hi, this is Urshu Pro with the Dr. Vax channel. And today, we're going to look at a brand new 3D printer that's only been available for a couple months, and that's the Ender 3. What? The Ender 3 has been available for a couple years. So the original Ender 3 was released in March 2018, and it revolutionized the world of consumer or really hobbyist 3D printing. Before the Ender 3, there were low-cost printers. The first low-cost printer that really was produced in volume by a major company was the Monoprice Select Mini. And the Select Mini was available sometime in 2016. But the Select Mini had a very, very small print area. The print area on the Select Mini was 120 by 120 by 120. The Ender 3, unlike the Select Mini, was not fully assembled. You had to put it together. But Creality claims you could do it in 10 minutes. Most people did it in a half hour, maybe a little bit more. It rarely took people more than an hour. So it was a relatively easy assembly, and we'll talk about that later in the video. But it had a print area approximately double the size, 220 by 220 by 250. So what's new with the version two? Because if you look at the Creality website, there are now five Ender printers. There are three models of the Ender 3. There are three models of the Ender 5. They range in price from a little bit under $200 to a little bit more than $400. So stay tuned. And let's learn together about the Creality Ender 3 version 2. Before I open up this printer for assembly, let me give you a little bit more information. I purchased it directly from the Creality China website for $259 and 99 cents. Um, I'm not sure why I uh, received a $10 discount. Maybe it was the day I purchased it. Um, so this is a printer I paid for. Let's look at the specs as they're listed on the website. Um, the most significant upgrade is it's a brand new control board. It's a 32-bit control board. Why is that important to you? It's important to you because there's more memory space on the control board. The control board is faster. That means when you use it with third-party products like Oct Octoprint over the USB port, it, uh, it will operate more quickly. And this new control board has the 2208 stepper drivers. What is a stepper driver? It's a chip on the control board that controls the movement of the stepper motors. And the 2208s do it in such a way that your printer is much, much quieter. Um, I've upgraded an Ender 5 to a control board with 2208s in it. And I can tell you it's night and day. The only thing you'll probably hear on this printer is the fan. It also, with this new control board has a bootloader. That means that you can upgrade the firmware more easily by loading firmware directly onto the SD card and just turning on the printer. That should allow Creality to keep this printer up to date more with less difficulty. It has power fail recovery. And because the power fail recovery and the filament out sensor technology are linked together more or less, um, you can upgrade at a future date this printer to have filament out detection. It also has support on the control board for a BL touch that would allow you to add auto bed leveling. It's a new color screen. It's a heavier Y axis rail. Um, so there should be uh, less artifacts on your print. It should print a little bit cleaner. The power supply is built in underneath I think it's a safer design, and they claim a Meanwell power supply that's a branded power supply. It uses a glass bed. One of the most common problems for the Ender 3 lines were that the beds were sometimes warped. A glass bed will almost completely eliminate that issue. It has XY axis tension rods. That means you can control the tension on the belt. The hot end has a cover on it. 
probably a safety feature, may make it a little harder to work on. Um, and we're not sure yet what version of Marlin is on this printer. Creality always puts their own version of firmware on the printers, um, but they're based on the Marlin build. It could be based on Marlin 1 or Marlin 2. Most 32-bit control boards are based on Marlin 2. So once we get this up and running, we'll hook it to a terminal monitor and we'll take a look and see if we can figure out what's going on. Okay, now let's take and break this printer open and take a first look at how it's packaged and the assembly. From what I understand, the assembly is almost identical to the Ender 3. That's both good and bad because the Ender 3 assembly was not all that difficult, um, but I did find it a little tricky to get the hot end onto the X axis. So let's take a look here. And I'll take this first piece of foam off the top. It's packaged quite tight. So we'll get rid of this. And now we'll tip this up so that you all can see that. And you can see here, uh, it's packaged quite well. Uh, there is a user manual. It looks like a, a really printed user manual. And it says version 1.2. So that's uh, good news. Um, I'm going to take this out of the box and then we'll come back and we'll take a look at the assembly. Okay, there's a, a lot of stuff here. So one of the things I noticed immediately was that this feels like it's from a much more mature company than the original Ender 3 and Ender 5s that I've assembled. I've also assembled Ender 3 Pros. And the reason is, first of all, the packaging was excellent. The foam was very dense. It was very, very well packed. And this user manual is clearly professionally produced and printed. Um, everything is in English and Chinese. Um, and I don't know how easy it is to use yet to follow this, but we'll find that out in a few moments. Um, there are separate thank you and warranty cards included. And uh, they make a point of giving you the uh, toll-free number and the email address and various ways to get um, after purchase support. So these, uh, these are quite impressive. On the other hand, there's a lot of stuff here. There are a lot of parts. Now, there are two reasons that Chinese manufacturers or overseas manufacturers from the perspective of whatever country you're in, ship printers that aren't fully assembled. The first is they save on assembly costs. The second is they save on shipping because international shipping is often done by volume. Now that makes this very interesting because just a few months ago, I don't know, maybe five months ago, four months ago, I assembled an ANET ET4. It was a really easy assembly. Um, the majority of the printer was pre-assembled. In this case here, that's not the case. Um, even rather trivial uh, components, this is a Z-axis limit switch, weren't pre-installed. So if this is your very first printer, I think this is an hour-long assembly, and you're going to want to watch a couple of videos ahead of time to learn some of the tricks of assembly. Now, on the other hand, once again, mature company. Everything is very clearly labeled in Chinese and English. Um, and let's go through what we have here. Well, the first thing I noticed is that uh, the hot end is fully assembled, including the new cover on the hot end. The Bowden tube is inserted into the hot end. Um, there is a silicon sock, actually a very nicely produced silicon sock around the hot end that should keep cooling more uniform. Um, it is going to be a little bit harder to get filament out that's stuck in the hot end because you're going to have to take off this cover first before you do that. Cable management on this printer is dramatically better. 
dramatically better. Um, that was one of the things I really liked about the ANET ET4 was the cable management was better. Cable management on this printer is dramatically better. There are lots of small parts here that you'll have to keep track of carefully during your assembly. As I noted, they are all marked. If we look at this base, it is heavy. This is quite heavy, uh, probably because the power supply, you can see where the power supply is, is directly in this base. And you can see they're using ribbon cable connectors for various connections. Um, this is really quite massive. Um, for the size, it, uh, it weighs quite a bit. There is a strain relief um, on this cable. This is the new uh, panel, the new control panel, and it's beautiful. Uh, we'll see how well it works, uh, but it's beautiful. It's partially pre-assembled. Now, in terms of the Y-axis, it's a serious piece of metal now. Um, the lead screw for the Z-axis is in this tube. Um, sometimes those are hard to find, so you'll want to look for that. Uh, you have the components for your filament holder that look to be the same as they were. You have your um, other extrusions here. We'll see where those fit. Um, and then, once again, as in all of these motors, you have three stepper motors. You have the X, Y, and the Z stepper motors. Um, and these look pr relatively similar to what I've seen before from Creality. They do ship with a little bit of filament. Uh, we're not going to use that. And the reason I don't use the filament from the manufacturers is it doesn't allow me to compare one printer to another. So I generally use the same hatchbox filament for all of my initial tests. There are a couple new components on this printer. There are tensioning devices for tensioning the belts. And there's a, uh, it looks like an injection molded uh, printed cap um, for the extruder motor. Um, and let's see where that will fit. That probably fits right here. And uh, let's see how that fits on. There's a flat area on this, so it fits on like that. And that will allow you to uh, load in filament more easily. Loading filament in a Creality Ender 3 printer was one of the hardest things for people to learn how to do. This extruder mechanism seems to be a next generation mechanism. Okay, I'm going to crack open the manual now. They do provide you a set of tools and I won't be using those. I like to use my own tools specifically. I like to use my own hex or Allen wrenches that are screwdriver shaped. I find those much, much easier to use. Now, as you're gonna learn in a minute, the assembly of this printer is not trivial. It is a little bit tricky, and I tried to cover some of the tricky aspects in this video. But I'll tell you, there's something on this SD card that surprised me. This SD card comes with a little adapter that makes it into a USB drive. You can plug it into your computer, your Mac, your Chromebook, your Windows computer. There's an updated version of the manual in there, and there is a video that shows you how to assemble the printer. Now, the video goes fairly quick, but it's very, very helpful. What's most important about the manual is I noticed they've added additional hints about things that people are running into trouble with. So I highly recommend, before you proceed, you look at what's on this SD card. So I'm gonna put this together. Uh, we'll put some of this on fast forward, then we'll come back and turn it on. Need to take my glasses off to read the manual. I'm going to periodically cut back um, to a close-up so that I can show you a detail. There are four pieces of extrusion in the uh, packaging. The bigger ones are your Z-axis extrusions. On the Z-axis extrusions, there are two versions. One that has just two holes in it, and the other that has two holes vertically. So one that has two holes horizontally, one that has two holes vertically. With the printer facing you so that you can open the little drawer, the one with the two holes vertically goes on the right, and the ones with the 
two holes horizontally go on the left. You're going to see that there are two extrusions that look like this. One is called the X-axis profile, and the other is called the gantry profile. So the one with just the four holes is the gantry profile, and the X-axis profile has one, two, three, four, five, six holes in it. When you're ready to assemble the X-axis onto the stepper motors, you'll notice there's a countersunk hole there three holes here, two small ones and a countersunk hole. The countersunk hole goes over this um, bolt right here that is holding on this wheel. So that just fits like that. And then you have to um, carefully uh, screw this in from the inside. The bolts go on the inside. So that's a little tricky, as I recall. There are holes here so you can get the screwdriver through the outside to connect to the screws on the inside to screw it in. So let me go ahead and do that. So now we have the X-axis. This is the X-axis limit switch that was already installed. We have the extruder, the extruder motor, and the X-axis motor. So now we're going to need to assemble the belt. So we have the belt wrapped around now through the gear on the inside here. It doesn't go around the outside. And this is actually going to connect down here towards the middle. Okay, now we have to assemble the set of pulleys. Uh, once again, there's a countersunk hole here that you can use to align this properly. And those pulleys are facing like this. And then there are uh, two holes in this extrusion that are threaded that will accept screws. So we're going to take and assemble this here. Okay, here's a problem that I've run in before I just forgot about. You want to put the hot end assembly on the gantry before you put these uh, wheels on the end. So I'm going to take this off, put the hot end assembly on, and then we'll continue. Okay, so you can see that we've done that now. Both of the belt ends are through the notches here, and the brass components are on the bottom. We will assemble the new belt tensioner on this end that will hold the belt tight. So we have the idle wheels on this side, we have the stepper motors on this side, we have the hot end in the middle. Okay, another example of something a little bit tricky. I had to take this one screw out here and the slot side of the tensioning bracket that I'm going to assemble here with the slot goes on this side. You'll see there's a little notch in here that slides over here and with the notch, and then you put one screw in this side and one screw in the other. So let me go ahead and do that. There we go. So now our hot end is properly assembled. It'll fit this way. It moves back and forth, and we'll be able to tighten this in order to tighten those belts. And you want those belts to not have any slack, um, so they have a little tension on them when you push on them. See, I'm pushing here, but you don't want to over-tighten. So no slack, but not over-tightened. Okay, we can always adjust those more later. Let's go to the next step. Okay, now we're getting down to brass tacks, some of the cosmetics. We're going to uh, assemble the gantry extrusion on the top. The countersunk holes go facing up. Okay, now we're going to attach the front panel. In my case, the screws are already in place, so I'm just going to loosen them a little bit because we have to align these bolts, these channel bolts, with the channel, with the extrusion. And at this point, we can attach that cable. So here is the ribbon cable that goes to the front panel. Um, these ribbon cables will always have a key or a notch, so they can only go in one way. Very well done. One nice cable management. 
Uh, let's put together our reel holder. You want it so there's a nice line between the end of the filament and the entry into the extruder. So we'll place it right there. Okay, we are almost done here. And uh, the good news is I don't have a lot of parts left here. Uh, a couple things here and there. Um, there is a wheel that goes on the top of the extruder to allow you to manually turn it. Um, it seems quite loose, but uh, it does work. Um, and then we have to attach our Bowden tube, that's the tube here, uh, to the uh, extruder. You just push that in until it's tight. Then they do give you a uh, little Bowden tube coupler tight tighteners. And uh, those are these little blue rings here. They go into uh, this coupler between the outside of the coupler and the inside of the coupler. So make sure this is pressed in. And uh, now we have to connect all the cables. Now all of the cables on this printer are labeled. So let's go through the stepper motors to make that easier for you to understand this. This is the X stepper motor. This is the extruder. That one is labeled E. And then we have the X limit switch. Okay, the last thing they recommend that you do is that you carefully check the voltage setting. There's a little window back here. Mine is set on 230. That will not work for me. Okay, so we are basically assembled here. I will tell you, I really like the fit and finish of this printer. Um, I have a couple screws left. I see I have an extra nozzle and an extra coupler. Um, that's very nice. Now, the print pad is a glass print pad with a special surface on top. Um, it has a piece of plastic on it right now, so I'm going to take off that piece of plastic. And it attaches to the surface of the printer with these little clips. Um, so you can take it off to remove a print. They do ship a paint spreader for taking prints off. I actually prefer using a single-edged razor blade very carefully on the surface. Uh, the surface feels quite nice. Okay, now I'm going to do a step that is a little bit controversial. Let me get my glasses back on here. I like to level the print bed before I even first power on the 3D printer. And the reason is I don't want the print head to get slammed down into the print bed for any reason. Now, in order to do that, I have to do a couple things. I have to adjust this Z access limit screw. So I'm going to loosen this up first. This is off on the side here. Let me turn this so you can see this a little bit here. This limit switch, which is right here, gets triggered when the print head hits this. Well, I wanna make sure that's in the right position first. So I'm gonna move it down out of the way. Then I'm going to put a post-it note onto my printer. Now this is where it gets controversial. If you recall, I mentioned that DC motors, that steppers are DC motors. And when you turn a DC motor by hand, it generates a current. It acts like a generator. So we're going to turn this very slowly because we are connected to the control board. Now I could just unplug this cable here. And I'll actually do that right now because this one is easy. Just have to remember to replug it in. And we're going to take and lower this until it just creates a little friction, a little too much. There we go. Hear that sound? That's a good sound. That's the amount of, of friction you want on the print bed. Now I'm going to slide this stepper motor switch back up. Now I'm going to raise this back up. As long as I'm here, I'm going to take and adjust these four corners. So there are a bunch of videos on the channel about doing this. I actually have a G-code file you can use to automatically move the print head. For right now, I'm gonna move it very slowly once again by hand because I don't want, and this is a little tight. When I want to move this a little tight, so I'm gonna loosen this a little bit. Wait till it just triggers. There we go. 
Ah, and it's too loose right now. So I have to loosen the spring here, and by loosening it, it will move this up. Okay, so that's about right for that position. Let me raise up the print head, move it over to the other side, and lower it down just till I hear that click. Okay, I've leveled the print bed. I'm going to double check that my screws for my Z limit screw are set properly. And now we'll take off this little piece of plastic. And I will take and power this printer up and we'll see how well it prints. Okay, I've printed a couple prints here we're going to talk about in a minute. But let's uh, first cover one of the first things that you notice about this printer. The first thing you notice is it's quiet. When I turn this printer on, you will hear the fans. And you can hear those fans kick in. I'll mute those a bit uh, with the video editing. However, it's not going to get louder. With most 3D printers, when you start printing, it gets louder. There's like a whining noise from the stepper motors. With this new 32-bit control board and the enhanced stepper drivers, this printer stays very quiet. The second thing I noticed right away about this printer is the new monitor, and I'll show you some close-ups of that. Uh, this control panel is excellent. It's very, very easy to navigate with this wheel here. And then you press to click. And based on the features that are available there, I'm pretty sure this is probably based on Marlin 2. In fact, most 32-bit boards use Marlin 2. And the reason is there are quite a number of advanced features for tuning the operation of this printer. Now, the next thing you'll notice is that when you go to print off the SD card that came with this, nothing shows up. Everything is in subdirectories and Marlin will only see the root directory. In fact, the subdirectory called models, if you just copy that up to the root directory, it won't see that either because those are STL files. They have to be sliced to create G-code. There's a version of Cura on this SD card, version 4.3, which is a relatively recent version, but it's for Windows. So I used my own version, which is 4.6.1 running on a Mac, that I downloaded uh, directly from the Cura website. And all I did is I selected Ender 3 Pro. I thought that would be closest to this printer. And I sliced and printed two beautiful models. The next thing you'll notice about this printer when you're using it is this print surface is wonderful and it sticks really, really well. In fact, my prints are sticking a little too well it's quite hard to get them off. I couldn't get them off with the paint scraper provided by Creality. Instead, I used a single edge razor blade. And what I found for the second print is I put a bit of magic goo on the print bed um, to make it easier to get the prints off. Magic goo loses its adhesion when the print cools down. So this is a very nice print surface. If anything, it sticks too well. Maybe I have the print head a little too close and should change the Z offset. So overall, very impressed. What about print quality? Excellent. This is a calibration cap, and this is used to determine the accuracy of extrusion. Okay, I have some calipers here. And let me turn this on and zero it. And this is supposed to be 20 millimeters and we'll see how well it did. And in this direction, it's 20.02. That's pretty darn close. In this direction, it's 20.09. Once again, excellent, excellent. But in addition, the print quality is very good. The overhangs are nice and smooth. The corners are sharp. Now, this is an STL file that I got off the SD card. It's, a, it's called a vase, beautiful SDL file. And printing it at full size, it would have filled out this full printer 
and it would have taken about eight hours to print. So I printed it at 30% in vase mode, and it's a good quality print. It's a really good quality print, but there are some bumps here. Now that's probably due to a Cura setting. There is a maximum segment size setting and a minimum segment size setting. These are settings that are in the experimental and advanced areas of Cura. And by changing those, I'm sure we could get rid of these few bumps. But overall, I'm delighted by the print quality on this printer. So it's quiet as a 32-bit board. It feels a little faster than my other Ender printers. This new print surface is excellent. The control panel is beautiful. Easy, easy to use. It has some nice features, and I'm sure Creality is going to be coming up with upgrade kits to add a BL touch and a filament sensor to this printer. I think you'll see those shortly because they're already accounted for on the control board, in the main control board. So do I recommend this printer? Absolutely, except for one thing. Just like the original Ender 3s, they're tricky to assemble. It's just little things make it uncomfortable, make it a little bit harder to assemble. And if you're not at all mechanically inclined, you're probably going to get frustrated. So watch the video on the SD card. Watch my video, watch other videos on YouTube, and then you'll have a good experience. If you're looking for a printer where basically it's fully assembled, look at the ANET ET4. Now that comes without these vertical um, extrusions attached. You have to attach it, but the whole X-axis mechanism is basically already assembled, so it really is a 15-minute assembly. Why do I recommend this printer over the ANET for a lot of people? Because the firmware on this printer is excellent. The software in the on the control board on the new 32-bit control board. The ANET ET4 is also 32-bit, but their firmware is not very good. And so while the ET4 comes better assembled with more features, it has a filament runout detector, and you can get it with an auto bed leveling sensor, the firmware is a shortcoming. So once again, Creality has put together an excellent printer. I expect you're going to see a V2 Pro very, very shortly that has additional features. And I hope this was helpful. So if this was helpful to you, give me a thumbs up, click on the bell, subscribe to the channel, recommend this to everyone you know. And if you wanna have a dialogue about this, go to forum.drvax.com and let's continue to talk. And more importantly, let's continue to learn together.